Because you, you realize how these mainstream outlets work. They ask you a question as absurd as, do you believe in equal pay? After you've laid out all of this nuance. So you don't believe in equal pay. Yes, I don't believe in equal pay. Jordan Peterson doesn't believe in equal pay. And then you proliferate that to everybody. And then it paints that person as a horrible individual that no one should listen to. And it's so disingenuous and so disgusting and it makes liberals look bad. Why do we do this? Ladies and gentlemen, amongst all of the politically infamous interviews that have been conducted in the recent era, there is no more notable example than the interview between Jordan Peterson and Kathy Newman. And if this is going to be a political analysis channel where we're analyzing conversations and providing our own insight, we got to react to this interview. I know it's over five years old, but I still see people reacting to it here and there. So it, it seems like folks are still watching this interview. It really is a very significant point of reference for what not to do in a conversation, at least on one side of the equation here. Before we continue, this channel is obviously new. So if you do enjoy this reaction video and you have been enjoying these reaction videos, click that subscribe button, like the video. And by the way, this isn't the main channel. We have another channel. It's called Gestalt Productions. There's a really cool video that we made talking about TikTok and some other things. So click the link above if you want to check that out. If you want to continue watching this reaction video, then Let's get into it. People have within them this capacity to set the world straight and, and that's necessary to manifest in the world. And that also doing so is where you find the meaning that sustains you in life. So what's gone so, wrong then? Oh God, all sorts of things have gone wrong. I, I think that, I don't think that young men are hear words of encouragement. Some, some of them never in their entire lives, as far as I can tell, that's what they tell me. And the fact that the words that I've been that I've been speaking, the YouTube lectures that I've done and put online, for example, have had such a dramatic impact is an indication that young men are starving for this sort of message because like, why in the world would they have to derive it from a lecture on YouTube? Specifically on that, if I might impose my perspective on how Jordan Peterson has become such a significant masculine voice. I think as we've witnessed the fracturing of the family. We have higher single motherhood rates here in Western nations than we did in previous decades. On the temperamental front, it appears as if men overall across these younger generations are becoming more feminine in terms of their temperament. And the values that we attempt to inculcate young men with are also more feminine. I remember going to primary school and all of the messages were about being kind and you want to be more inclusive. You can't bully each other. Fighting outside with sticks is super dangerous. It's bad. It's like there's nothing wrong with promoting more feminine messages. But if that's the sole message that is being promulgated, then you're going to leave people out of balance as far as the, the early levels of education are concerned. Part of it is that that age group tends to attract more women, more female teachers at those age ranges. And so you would expect primary school in, in general would have more feminine values being expressed. But nonetheless, you have this culture that is encouraging men to act more temperamentally feminine. And that's reflected in the statistics, by the way. I'm going to put this chart up just so that you can see. And I would say this feminization of men is in some way connected with the fact that there have been fewer fathers in households and there has been less masculinity in general present within homes. What happens when this is the case? It leaves a vacuum, and people like Jordan Peterson fill the vacuum. One of the ways I've conceptualized this is, as a society, we are shifting more and more of the masculinity away from human males, redistributing it to our algorithms. What is masculinity in essence? It's that which provides structure, it's that which provides order, it's that which sets the rules of the house and keeps them firm. And in many ways, we are doing that now, but we are doing that with the algorithms that we create. The algorithms are a set of rules, and they're a set of rules that are imposing a kind of way of life on people. Now, if you spend more and more of your time on the internet, this is especially the case. We've taken that masculine responsibility that is historically existent within the father, and we have left it in the hands of corporations with a profit interest. And that is very dangerous. And we are suffering the consequences of that today. Now, they're not being taught that they, that it's important to develop yourself. But does it, does it bother you that your audience is predominantly 
male. Does that, isn't, isn't that a bit divisive? No, I don't think so. I mean, isn't it a bit divisive that young men find your content more compelling? It's very interesting. Do you think that certain messages might be more persuasive to different demographics of people? The implication here is that all messages should resonate the same amount with everybody. I find that very odd. It's no more divisive than the fact that YouTube is primarily male and Tumblr is primarily well, that's pretty divisive, female, isn't well, it? Tumblr is primarily female. And you sort of get to see the bias come in. YouTube is primarily male. Well, that's divisive as well, isn't it? And she doesn't even hear him say Tumblr is primarily female. He has to repeat it again. I actually think it would be better for argument's sake if he had put that it's no more divisive than Tumblr being primarily female and YouTube be being primarily male, because it, at least in that case, she wouldn't have interrupted him. You might find this interesting as well. I was talking with my fiance about Pinterest. You know, P Pinterest is also 75% female. The question is why? Now, I personally have never found any kind of interest with Pinterest. I mean, interest with Pinterest, that's kind of funny. And the reason why we were starting to discuss this together is that Pinterest does seem to have this element of gathering. We're going to pin this, we're going to pin this, we're going to pin this, we're going to pin this. And so I, I suspect that it has this very deep historical relevance, given where we came from as ancestors. That, of course, is complete speculation. We're just sort of shooting shit with one another. But I thought I should share that. You might find that at least an intriguing hypothesis. But you're just saying that's the way it is. Well, it's, I'm not saying anything. It's just an observation that that's the way it is. Um, there's plenty of women that are watching my lectures and coming to my talks and buying my books. It's just that the majority of them happen to be men. Uh, it's, What's in I, it for the women, though? It's truly an unbelievable question, right? Why would communicating a pro-male message be good for women? Are the relations between men and women really so fragmented at this point that what is good for one sex would not also be somewhat beneficial to the other? This is not a war. If you have a mindset that one sex's victories are another one's defeats, then you're going to have these kinds of mentalities creep into your psychology as we see existent inside Kathy Newman. Women want, deeply want, men who are competent and powerful. And, and I don't mm -hmm. mean power in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in that they can exert tyrannical Ooh. control over others. And this is great too, because he recognizes that he's used a word, powerful. Power might elicit in Kathy Newman's mind, the patriarchy. Women are looking for men who embody the patriarchy? What are you saying? And he says, no, 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 not that kind of tyrannical power, a different kind of power, a power of competence. Brilliant. And this is what's required sometimes in conversation. We have to be very careful with our language. Certain words not only have connotations from our own end, but they have connotations from other people's ends. The way liberals and conservatives communicate with one another requires a knowledge of the other's connotations from both ends. And I don't think we have that at this point, but it'll help us communicate moving forward. So that's essential. That's not power. That's just corruption. Power is competence. And why in the world would you not want a competent partner? Well, I, I know why actually. You can't dominate a competent partner. So, so if you want women domination, want to dominate. Right. And, and that's a natural follow up question from someone who has a one track mind. You're implying that women are interested in dominating men in the cases where they're not selecting partners based on their competence. Let's hear the response. Is that what you're saying? No, I'd say women who have had their relationships impaired with impaired their relationships with men impaired and who are afraid of such relationships will settle for a weak partner because they can dominate them. But it's a suboptimal solution. Do you it think that's what a lot of women good. are doing? I think there's a substantial minority of women who do that. <laughs> and that is very tactful language as well. Substantial minority. Substantial enough to not be something we can just ignore. But it's not like this is happening everywhere. It's much easier to make that claim as well, a substantial minority. When you say majority, you're saying over 50%. Now you're making quite a hefty claim. Substantial minority, 1%, it's a minority, but 1% of 250 million people is a, still a substantial minority. There's still a lot of people. Are we talking 1%, 2%, 3%? All of these are substantial minorities when you're dealing with large enough sample sizes. 
To add one more point there, women that might be settling for, say, a less masculine male or a, a male that wouldn't make them feel as if they are inclined to submit. Submission is a term that is, has this very dirty reputation, perhaps because we live in a culture that prizes domination and power so much. If you think about feminism as a movement, it seeks to embed masculine characteristics inside women that are more dominating, that take control of more situations. And, and some of that, I think, comes from a place of not recognizing the beauty of submission. Submission doesn't have to be bad. Submission is not equivalent to you lost. Submission is acceptance. Submission is reverence. Submission is respect. Submission is appreciation. And we're not supposed to just be dominant or just be submissive. Like, men aren't just supposed to be solely dominant and women aren't supposed to. That's, that's not what this is about. This is about integrating qualities inside ourselves with the recognition that certain qualities might statistically speak to one sex over the other. This is, this is complicated stuff, but let's continue. And I think it's very bad for them. They're very unhappy. It's very bad for their partners, although their partners get the advantage of not having. Some are unhappy. Some are perfectly happy. I do think some women enjoy taking that more dominant role. They might want to be more submissive in this context, but more dominant in this context. But his point here is valid, especially within the context we're in where submission to masculine authority from the standpoint of a woman has become faux pas. To even bring that up in conversation is to take a social risk. But what gives you the right to say that? I mean, maybe that's how women want their relationships, those women. I mean, you're making these vast generalizations. It's a fair I'm point. I'm a clinical psychologist. Right, so you've, you're saying you've done your research and women are unhappy dominating men. I certainly have encountered within conversations with various women that they would prefer their partner to have a little bit more masculinity, especially femininely tempered women. And individuals should really be equipped with the knowledge of whether they have more feminine or masculine temperament and within which contexts these juxtaposed energies manifest. That's essential. That's self-knowledge. And if you have that knowledge about yourself, you're going to be more informed when it comes time to select a partner. There's intense pleasure in momentary domination. That's why people do it all the time. Yep. But it's no formula for a long-term, successful long-term relationship. That's reciprocal, right? Any long-term relationship is reciprocal, <laughs> virtually by definition. You saw a little cr smile creep onto her face there because she knew that he was right and that she wasn't able to quite corner him. I think Kathy Newman very much enjoys these dynamics too. I remember watching uh, some post-interview gossip about how Kathy Newman perceived the interview while she was getting lambasted by a bunch of people. I think she genuinely enjoyed the combative nature of the conversation. I think she gets off on this. I think she has a very masculine temperament. There is almost a thrill in her trying to corner him and him being able to get out of it and her realizing, oh crap, I, I didn't get him there. But I want to put to you that here in the UK, for example, let's take that as an example, the gender pay gap stands at just over 9%. You've got women at the BBC recently saying that the broadcaster is illegally paying them less than men to do the same job. You've got only seven women running the top FTSE 100 companies. Yeah. So it seems to a lot of women that they're still being dominated and excluded, to quote your words back to you. It does seem that way, but multivariate analysis of the pay gap indicate that it doesn't exist. And I would say if you're looking to make a strong statement that cuts through, this is the way to go about doing it. Multivariate analysis, the pay gap says it does not exist. Multivariate analysis of the pay gap shows that it only accounts for aggregated annual earnings between men and women without paying attention to a whole bunch of other variables. Not as punchy in the moment. He'll get into the nuance here. But that's just so not do, true, is it? I mean, that 9% pay gap, that's a gap between median... And I will say, to give her credit, at least she's using the 9% figure as opposed to the 79 cents or 81 cents to the dollar, which was thrown around... God, that's been thrown around for decades. I remember seeing Thomas Sowell debating this statistic way back in the 1970s. I would not agree with that. If you're talking about women with the same number of years of experience, with the same continuous service, et cetera, et cetera, then when I look at that, I don't find that disparity. I find, for example, in many cases, the women are making more, depending on how you break the data down. But yeah, you always have to dig into where the differences derive. I do think as far as a woman's 
capacity to operate in the workplace in the same way a man does. There is some challenge there. There is some additional hurdle. And maybe if the woman has a male boss, that that hurdle is intensified. Women are playing by slightly different rules than men. Women accrue certain advantages in comparison to men, but men in the workplace context have advantages over women as well. I think this is this is balanced. But as far as the, the pay gap is concerned, it's a completely different question, whether the people are being paid differential wages only for the reason of them being different sexes. That's the claim. And when you dig into the numbers, that's not a fair claim. But there's, that multiple, exists. Yeah, but there's multiple reasons for that. One of them is gender, but it's not the only reason. Like if you're a social scientist worth, worth your salt, you never do a univariate analysis. Like yep. you say, well, women in aggregate are paid less than men. Okay, well, then we break it down by age. We break it down by occupation. We break it down by interest. We break it down by personality. Why should, Why should women, women be put content up with it? I'm not, not saying to that they the should talk. put up with it. I'm saying that the claim that the wage gap between men and women is only due to sex is wrong. And it is wrong. There's no doubt about that. The multivariate analysis have been done. Well, so I, I can give you, you an example. You keep on talking wait, about multivariate wait, wait analysis. Let me give you an example. example. I'm saying that 9% pay gap exists. Yeah. Yeah. That's a gap between men and women. I'm not saying why it exists, but it exists. Now, yeah, if you you're a woman, that seems exists. pretty unfair. If the aims of men and women were equivalent without any variation statistically, that would be unfair. But there are primary differences between the sexes and they manifest statistically. You only need to do the most minute amount of psychological research, how men and women choose different occupations, about how men and women differ when it comes to personality characteristics. And is it unfair? It's only unfair depending on your perspective. If you live in such a dominator culture as we do, I'll use the Terence McKenna term. You're gonna think it's unfair because you prioritize all the masculine characteristics and you want to make more money and you want to be recognized for success and you want to be strong and confident and bold and being kind and helpful and compassionate isn't good enough because it's weak. Yeah, if you view the feminine characteristics as worse than the masculine characteristics, you're gonna think all of this is unfair. But you don't have to think that. That's merely a delusion of perspective. But do you agree that it's unfair? If you're a woman- Not necessarily. And on average, you're getting paid 9% less than a man. That's not fair, is it? It depends on why it's happening. I can give you an example. Okay, there's a personality trait known as agreeableness. Agreeable people are compassionate and polite. Here we go. And agreeable people get le paid less than, dis than less agreeable people for the same job. Women are more agreeable than men. Again, a vast generalization. Some it's women are not more agreeable than yes, men. Yes, that's true, but that's right. And some women get paid more than men. Bingo. So it's perfect when someone else, through one of their own assertions, makes way for you to prove your own point. And if women are more inclined to be agreeable, on average due to who knows how many evolutionary factors, then there is going to be a steeper climb for them to gain the same kind of recognition in the workplace. But maybe expecting that men and women would all be playing the same game together is an unrealistic presumption. Women are too agreeable to get the pay rises they I'm, deserve. No, I'm saying that that's one component of a multivariate equation that predicts um, salary. It accounts for maybe 5% of the variance, something like that. So surely so you the need answer... About another 20, you need about another 18 factors, one of which is gender. And so there is prejudice, there's no doubt about that, but it accounts for a much smaller proportion of the variance in the pay gap than the radical feminists claim. Okay, so rather than denying the pay gap exists, which is what you did at the beginning of this conversation... That's one of the downsides of him making that bold statement at the beginning. Multivariate analysis shows that the pay gap does not exist. She's able to reference that moving forward as, well, you said it didn't exist, and now you're backing off of that statement. Rather than being agreeable and not asking per, for a pay rise, go and ask for a pay rise. I, Make yourself disagreeable with your boss. Oh, definitely, there's that. But I also didn't deny it existed. I denied it existed because of gender. Right, and, and that, I would say, is actually a bit dishonest. Multivariate analysis of the pay gap indicate that it doesn't exist. 
That's what he has implied moving forward here. He has unpacked his perspective fully. But the initial statement did not mention gender. Sometimes it's, it's difficult to remember what you said earlier in the conversation. He might have forgotten that that was not his initial claim. But yeah, I mean, she's right. The first thing he said was that it did not exist, period. I mean, the pay gap between men and women exists. You're saying it's not because of gender, it's because women are too agreeable to ask for pay rises. So it's make one them... of the reasons. Okay, one of the reasons. So why not get them to ask for a pay rise? I've Wouldn't done that, that, I've done that many, many times in my career. And they just I've don't. Counseled. Oh, they... <laughs> this is one of my favorite moments in the conversation. She is really trying to imply that he's the bad guy here. That he's gone through, I've tried to get women to ask for pay raises and become more assertive, but they just won't do it. And so women are incompetent. And he's like, I have. And they do it all the time. She tried to feed him his line and she was totally wrong. And they just don't do it. And they do it all the time. <laughs> this is what happens when you enter a conversation with total bias. You, you, you don't know where your guest is. You think they hold all of these viewpoints and agendas. And it turns out, you're just totally off base. Or at the very least, and perhaps this is more cynical, she realizes that he actually is a decent person who wants success for both men and women, but she still wants to paint the narrative anyway because that's what she gets paid to do. But maybe I'm being too unfair now in my casting. Do you, do you agree that you would be happy if that pay gap was eliminated completely? It because that's all the radical feminists are saying. It would depend on how it was eradicated and how the, how, how the disappearance of it was measured. And you're saying if you it's at the cost of men, that's a problem. Oh, there's all sorts of things that it could be at the cost of. It could even be at the cost of women's own interests. So Because they might not be happy if they get equal pay. No, because it might interfere with other things that are causing the pay gap that women are choosing to <sighs> like do. Like having well, children. Perfect. Well, or choosing careers that actually happen to be paid less, which women do a lot of. But why shouldn't women have the right to choose not to have children or the right to choose they, those they, demanding careers? They do. They can. Yeah, that's fine. But you're saying that makes them unhappy, by and large. <laughs> I'm saying that that... No, I'm not saying that. I'm, I, and I actually haven't said that so far. You're in the saying program. it makes them miserable. No, I said beginning. that what was making them miserable was having, part, was having weak partners. Very good. That makes them miserable. Right, right. And again, look, she gives that little cheeky smile because I think she realizes she was being very imprecise with the claim that it was making them miserable. Oh yes, right, that was a previous part of the conversation when we were talking about a different subject. Oopsies. I guess my producers just told me I should try to bury him in whatever way I could. Women have to get the major pieces of their life put together faster than men, which is also partly why men aren't under so much pressure to grow up. So because for the typical woman- Such a great point. Um, she has to have her career and family in order pretty much by the time she's 35, because otherwise the options start to run out. And so that puts a tremendous amount of stress on women, especially at the end of their 20s. I think I take issue with the idea of the typical woman. And this is why you have differences in terms of male and female maturation. A five-year-old male might not be at the same point developmentally as a five-year-old female. If they're at different developmental stages, then you might expect it would be a little bit harder for a five-year-old male to function in the classroom at that age relative to his female counterpart. Or we can just give them a bunch of methylphenidate stimulant medication, quell their impulsive urges, have them anesthetized at their desks. Now, I'm sure there won't be any consequences for putting a bunch of boys on ADHD medication. It, no way that there would be a consequence for that. No, the medication only has beneficial outcomes. It only helps young boys focus more in school. Yeah, there's no relation with decreased appetite or depression. What are you talking about? Well, I mean, there's a lot are, of money, it's certain, an interesting there's job. There's a certain you know? number of, of men, although not that many, who are perfectly willing to sacrifice virtually all of their life to the pursuit of a high-end career. So they'll work. These are men that are very intelligent. They're usually very, very conscientious. They're very driven. They're very high energy. They're very healthy. And they're willing to work 70 or 80 hours a week, nonstop, specialized at one thing to get to the top. So you're saying women are just more sensible. They don't want that because it's not a nice life. Well, I'm saying that's part of it, definitely. And 
So I work so you, for... So you don't think there are barriers in their way that prevent them getting to the top oh, of those Oh, there are companies. some barriers, yeah. Like, other, like men, for example. I mean, to get to the top of any organization is an incredibly competitive enterprise. And other women who are trying to do the same thing too. In a competitive environment, everybody is a barrier to everybody. <laughs> You're trying to win. <laughs> oh, man. But it's the barriers that allow people to grow. Stress is a fundamental component of growth. If we were all to sit around and do nothing all day, we'd just get fat and lazy and would and turn into plump couch potatoes. Maybe that is what's happening. Let me put something else to you from the book. You say the introduction of the equal pay for equal work argument immediately complicates even salary comparison beyond practicality mm -hmm. for one simple reason. Who decides what work is equal? It's not possible. So the uh -huh. simple question is, do you believe in equal pay? Well, I made the argument there. It's like, it depends on so who defines it. So you don't believe it. in equal pay. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the moment when you know, just, oh, this is ridiculous. Because you, you realize how these mainstream outlets work. They ask you a question as absurd as, do you believe in equal pay? After you've laid out all of this nuance. So you don't believe in equal pay. Yes, I don't believe in equal pay. Jordan Peterson doesn't believe in equal pay. And then you proliferate that to everybody. And then it paints that person as a horrible individual that no one should listen to. And it's so disingenuous and so disgusting and it makes liberals look bad. Why do we do this? The left cannot put forth ideas that are persuasive. If they are pulling disingenuous tactics like this, directed against reasonable individuals with people's best interest at heart. And I know this is a five, five-year-old interview. Over time, Jordan Peterson, who attempted to brand himself as, I'm not inherently conservative, I'm just for the individual, and I'm not a political person, I'm running a psychological movement, has now joined with the Daily Wire, and I think more of his messaging has become politicized. I think Jordan Peterson has somewhat been drawn in by right-wing echo chambers, or at least it's easier for him to access the right wing at this stage. But then again, that doesn't mean he's a bad person. That doesn't mean he's not trying to integrate nuance into his messaging. It just means that the way he's gone about expressing this message has appealed to conservatives way more, and he hasn't quite been able to hold on to as many of his liberal viewpoints. I think he's lost some of that ability over time. Just as a little bit of evidence for that point, anecdotal evidence, Marianne Williamson, Democratic presidential candidate, I heard her say that she liked Jordan Peterson when he first came on the scene. And over time, it seemed to her that he's become more angry and more of a bitter right winger who's politically motivated. So that's an example of someone on the left who has, has lost connection with Jordan Peterson due to the way things have developed. But look, life isn't perfect. There are trade-offs. You're going to make mistakes along the way. Too. for the top but you're going to yeah. put all those hurdles in their way as has been in their way for centuries no. and that's fine you're saying no, that's no. fine no no i think i really the think patriarchal system really is just that's fine. silly i do i think that's silly i really do i mean look look at your situation you're hardly unsuccessful yeah and i have how do you quite hard to get exactly where I've got to. good so that's okay you. battling is good this is all it's about the inevitable fight. But you talk about men why, fighting. Why I mean, let me just put another thing to you from the book. Why You're saying you have to real... battle for a high quality position. <laughs> <laughs> why wouldn't you have to battle for a high quality position? I was on the train with a woman a little while ago, and we were having a political disagreement. And at one point, I asked her, Do you think that there's value in competition? And she told me, No, competition is bad, competition is evil. Competition pitting sides against each other to the purpose of testing each one's capabilities is how each side gets stronger. And it's through the battle that she earned this position. And think about how undesirable for her it would have been from a fulfillment viewpoint if she had just been handed the position. Like, oh, here you go. You're one of the lead anchors at Channel 4 News. Well, what did I do to earn this? Nothing. You just get it. No, she worked her ass off to get it, and she attained it. And that must have felt fucking amazing, and she must be able to walk through life with her head held high as a result of putting in all of that hard work and battling and dealing with adversity and earning it. And she's making it seem like battling wasn't a good thing? <laughs> like... No, battling is why your position is so desirable and why you have influence and why it's a tragedy that you're handling the interview 
in this way. What about real conversations between women? Is that something, or are we sort of too amenable and reasonable? <laughs> no, it's just that the domain of physical conflict is sort of off limits for you. And well, you just said that I fought to get where I've got. Yeah, but what does that make me? Well, a I don't proxy imagine. Man? I don't imagine that you. Fought. Yeah, to some degree, I suspect you're not very agreeable. So that's the thing. Successful women. I'm not very agreeable. Right. But I've noticed that actually in this conversation. <laughs> At least, and I'm sure it served well. your career well. And he brings it back through all of this antagonism. He brings it back to a way where he's able to compliment her for all of the qualities that have made his experience rather uncomfortable. It's perfect. This is how you deal with people who are difficult to deal with and still make them like you on the other side. Basically have to wear the trousers in your view. They have to sort of become men to succeed is what you're saying. Well, if they're going I've to had to fight to succeed, if therefore they're going to I'm an against man. men, certainly masculine traits are going to be helpful. I mean, one of the things I do in, in my counseling practice, for example, when I'm consulting with women. If you think about it practically, one side is going to change, and perhaps there's a little bit of both going on. Women are becoming more masculine to try to attain these positions that have been historically allied with the patriarchy. And simultaneously, liberal institutions have encouraged men and the, the types of men who have been historically privileged to back off, become submissive, submit to us. And on a societal level, men have become temperamentally more feminine. So the messaging has worked. and. How's it going? How's our society doing? Ha has the result been desirable? You tell me. I won't even make a claim about this. I, I would, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of implying that we're going through a difficult time, but like seriously, it hasn't all been bad. We've gotten some good things as a consequence of these various gender movements. There are trade-offs though, and it might serve us well to at least acknowledge and appreciate the trade-offs. Arguably, yeah. there are still men dominating our industries, our society, and therefore they've dictated the terms for so long that women have to battle to no, be like the men. No, it's not true. It's not true. So, for example, the well, I can give you a, an example very quickly. So, I worked with women who work in how high power. She has made a claim, a sociological claim, about men controlling these positions in an oppressive way. This narrative has been accepted to such a degree that she has the audacity to say, what's your evidence that this isn't happening? For my positive claim, you need evidence to refute it. How about you provide evidence for your positive claim? Multivariate evidence. Are women less There's, intelligent than men? No, large? no, they're not. No, the, the, the data on that's pretty clear. The average IQ for a woman and the average IQ for a man is identical. There is some debate about the flatness of the distribution, which is something that James Damore pointed out, for example, in his memo. But and uh, he didn't get into this in the interview. He said there's some debate about the flatness of the distribution. I think it was strategically wise for him to not try to make that point in this debate context. I think it just would have caused way too many landmines. But I'll go into it because we have the time. When it comes to the flatness of the curves, male IQs exist more at the extremes. This is one of the reasons, in, in my view, why we have more male geniuses, more men who are like Terry Tao and are like Magnus Carlsen, as well as more male homelessness. And female intelligence is more clustered toward the center. Being a male, in some sense, as far as statistics are concerned, is the story of notable failure and notable achievement. And there's more responsibility associated with that. The, the, the cost is higher for failing as a man. You fail, you're, you're, you're fucked. You end up on the street. And of course, women can end up on the street too. It's just not as statistically likely. And perhaps some women are envious of the fact that men have this higher burden of responsibility placed on them because it means more control over your destiny. But again, it's comes with trade-offs. Feminine traits, why are they not desirable at the top of this? It's hard to say. I'm just laying out the empirical evidence. Like we know the, we know the traits that predict success. But we also know because companies by and large have not been dominated by women over the centuries, we have nothing to compare it to. It's an experiment. True, and it could be the case that if companies modified their behavior and became more feminine, that they would be successful. But you there's no evidence for it. I'm not neither doubtful nor non-doubtful. There's no evidence So why not for it. give it a go, as the radical feminists Because the feminist evidence suggests, say. well, it's fine. If, if, like, if someone wants to start a company and make it more feminine and compassionate, let's say, 
and caring in its overall orientation towards its workers and towards the marketplace, then that's a perfectly reasonable experiment to run. My point is that there is no evidence that those traits predict success in the workplace. And there's because plenty of evidence. Been... And to that point, Kathy Newman's point of why don't we create companies that are more compassionate and are measuring something different than the typical measurements associated with economic productivity. In a sense, I'm for it. One of my goals, one of the things I'm going to talk about on this channel, on my other channel, and one of the things I want to accomplish beyond YouTube, YouTube's a nice start. You gain some influence. You get a voice. You're able to collaborate more. I want to create an organizational structure where people are compensated to go to therapy. And that's going to take a hell of a lot of work and a hell of a lot of argumentation because I know people are not going to initially be on board. Paying people to go to therapy, and by the way, specifically paying people to attend psychedelic assisted therapy, because I think that could really, really help people, especially as uh, decriminalization and legalization for medicinal uses moves forward in this country. I, I believe we have an opportunity to incentivize something pro-social like therapy in a way that could have major economic implications for savings, for saving on substance abuse and incarceration and, and domestic violence, all of these other domains where we would save money simply by investing in something pro-social. And that's a type of workplace environment. It's not traditional work because therapy isn't traditional work, but therapy is work. It's a service, but it's also work. So it's a little paradoxical. You gotta financially incentivize it and maybe we'll be rewarded on the other side. You cited freedom of speech in that. Why should your right to freedom of speech oh, the famous trump line. a trans person's right not to be offended? Because in order to be able to think, you have to risk being offensive. I mean, look at the conversation we're having right now. You know, like you're certainly willing to risk offending me in the pursuit of truth. Why should you have the right to do that? It's been rather uncomfortable. I'm going to add this because I think we get in these battles right and left. The right will call the left a bunch of liberal snowflakes. The left will get offended and the right gets offended by all sorts of things too. I mean, believe me, holy shit. The right can be a bunch of conservative snowflakes. But the trope at this point is that left-wing individuals do not take offense very well. And I, I think there's some balance here. If you're going to say things that are true, you need to risk being offensive. But there is also an ideal to strive toward on the left, on the right, on the right, where we are attempting to communicate with one another in a way that won't inherently piss the other off. If we're going to solve problems, if we're going to integrate a liberal and conservative perspective, we need to be able to actually have these communications across the barriers. And that means that despite saying things that are offensive, it's contingent upon both sides, both one side to grow up, don't get as offended, and the other side. Maybe perhaps you need to modify your message a little bit. Maybe there's a better way you can say that. Both of these things exist. That's where I will infuse a little bit of my liberalness into this conversation. <laughs> You're saying that trans activists no. could lead to the deaths of millions of people. What no, I'm saying that the philosophy that drives their utterances is the same philosophy that already has driven us to the deaths of millions of people. Okay, tell us how that philosophy, any way comparable, Sure, that's no problem. The first thing is, is that the philosophy presumes that group identity is paramount. And that's the fundamental philosophy that drove the Soviet Union and Maoist China. And it's the fundamental philosophy of the left-wing activists. It's identity politics. It doesn't matter who you are as an individual. It matters who you are in terms of your group identity. You're just that's saying murderous... these things, though, to provoke, aren't you? I mean, Not you a are bit. a provocateur. I never say You're like anything... the alt-right that you hate to be compared to. You um, want to stir things up. I'm only a provocateur insofar as... When I say what I believe to be true, it's provocative. I don't provoke. Maybe for you humor. Don't set out now I feel the need to say this because oftentimes when Jordan Peterson is criticized by those on the left, they will point to his focus on the individual and his lack of attention to the importance of group identity. I think there's strong camaraderie to be built within a group. We have very strong psychological tendencies that incentivize us to identify with an in-group, our group identity is better than your group identity. I don't think it has to be like this. There is a way of different groups forging some kind of collective unity. And this isn't identity politics. This is group identity union. Very difficult to achieve, but it, it, it is kind of the recognition that despite the fact that you have your own individual convictions, 
and you're embedded within a group that has their own group convictions that perhaps every other group within this massive equation, this computation we call life, humanity, the universe, perhaps we're all essential in some way. Perhaps even when others are not treating you in the way that you desire, perhaps that treatment is still necessary in some way. I mean, there's a saying that we should all treat each other the way that we would want to be treated, the golden rule. I think that's a limited perspective. I think fundamentally we need to be trying to treat everybody the way that they want to be treated, which implies some degree of, of consensual manipulation. Because if we're treating everyone the way that they want to be treated, then we're not always abiding by our own individual convictions. We're sort of adapting our behavior to other people's needs, and it's a very, tri very tricky business. That's why it's an ideal, and I thought I should say that, because I don't think it's as simple as the individual is always paramount in all cases, and focusing on group identity has no value. Identity politics has a lot of drawbacks, yeah. But uh, identity politics has also pushed things forward. The abolition of slavery. Slavery in this country would not have been abolished without identity politics. Identity politics did push things forward in some sense. It did lead to a war. Things aren't so simple, are they? idea of hierarchy has absolutely nothing to do with sociocultural construction, which it doesn't. Let me just get this straight. You're saying that we should organise our societies <laughs> along the lines of the lobsters. I'm saying that it's inevitable that there will be continuity in the way that animals and human beings organise organize their structures. Effortless. Effortless. He was almost ready for it at that point because he experienced the entire interview being misinterpreted. And it sounded like he just had that response locked and loaded like yep she's gonna say something ridiculous like we should organize our societies like that of lobsters and i'm gonna be ready with this precise designation of what's going on in the chess in game right stuff. there's lots of things that you can do Subscribe. although you can't break the rules of the chess game and continue to play chess and biological your your biological nature is somewhat like that is it sets the rules of the game but within those rules you have a lot of leeway but the idea that one thing we can't do is say that hierarchical organization is a consequence of the capitalist patriarchy. It's like, that's patently absurd. It's wrong. It's not a matter of opinion. It's seriously wrong. Aren't you just whipping people up into a state of anger? And not at all. You, divisions between men and women. Mm -hmm. You're stirring people up. You know, you have people, any critics of you online get absolutely lambasted by your followers. Mm -hmm. And by call me, them off, generally. <laughs> Sorry, your critics get lambasted by you. I mean, is that academics, irresponsible? Not at all. If an academic is going to come okay. after me and tell me that I'm not qualified and that I'm not, I don't know what I'm talking about. So I you're not going to say to your followers now, quit the abuse, quit the anger. Well, we'd need some substantial examples of the abuse and the anger before I could detail that question. There's a lot of it out so, there. For, well, let, let's take a more general. There is anger. But where's that anger coming from? Why does that anger exist? And how does that reflect on our own failures as a society? So I have had 25,000 letters since June, something like that. And then this. From people who told me that I've brought them back from the brink of destruction. And so I'm perfectly willing to put that up against the rather vague accusations that my followers are making the lives of people that I've targeted miserable. Jordan Peterson, thank you. <laughs> my pleasure. Nice talking with you. A fascinating interview. It will leave an impact for many years to come, I'm sure. And I hope that you took something interesting from my own analysis of this exchange.